fear is going to exist. Trust is the opposite of fear. Connecting with things that allow you to feel safe, safe inside of your body, safe inside of your home, safe inside of your relationships, safe and secure and rooted and grounded and connected to the earth. Like all of those things for me make me feel safe enough to cast and to release my physical possessions out into the world. Welcome to Spark Joy, the podcast dedicated to celebrating the Kamari method and the transformative power of surrounding yourself with joy and letting go of all the rest. With your hosts and certified Kamari consultants, Kristen Ivey and Karen Sochi. And now, here's the show. Caitlin B. Neal is a sex and relationship coach who helps men and women have the best sex of their lives. She's based in Chicago and works with clients all over the world on experiencing greater pleasure, knowing exactly what they want, and feeling confident in their relationships. I met Caitlin in a mutual networking group for entrepreneurs. It's called Lighthouse Squad, and it's led by Saya Hillman, who we chatted with in SparkJoy episode 54. I'm fascinated by what Caitlin does for a living, but also how closely it's connected to intuition and what I do for a living. So that's what we're going to explore today. Welcome to Spark Joy, Caitlin. Hi, thank you for having me. Welcome, Caitlin. Hi, thank you. You're the first sex and relationship coach I've ever met in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you're definitely the first that we've ever had on Spark Joy. Please tell us a little bit about your background and your journey and what led you to really turn to intuition as a vehicle to help people improve their relationships. Well, I'm very excited, very honored to be holding this space and being the first. Hopefully I won't be the last. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be a lot more of us in the future. What led me to be a sex and relationship coach? I was fortunate from a very early age. I knew that I wanted to help people have better sex. Like, before I was sexually active, before I even explored sex for myself, I just always found it to be really, really interesting. I used to ask my parents to drop me off at the bookstore and I would sit in the like sexual health and erotic section of the bookstore and just devour all of the information that I could. And so it was just like a very natural calling, which to your point, like I think that I was led early on intuitively that this is what I was going to do with my life. But it did take me a while to actually just acknowledge that. You know, sometimes you get that pull or that sense that you're being kind of yanked in one direction. But it was hard from an early age. You know, I'm a Midwestern girl. I grew up in a suburb of Detroit. I had pretty typical Midwestern parents. We didn't talk about sex in our household. I had a really standard, I would say, like typical normal Midwestern upbringing. And I was very afraid of acknowledging and speaking, you know, frankly about what I wanted to do with my life. And so instead of figuring out a way of like delivering quality sexual advocacy for people, instead I went a hardcore science route. So I got my master's in public health. I went to Indiana University. I was like a study coordinator for the Center for Sexual Health Promotion, which is sort of like the hard science version of what the Kinsey Institute does. I was invited to go and get my PhD. And I was all the way working on my doctorate and miserable. I was so, so successful and so unhappy, almost to the point where my intuition was like, we're so close. We're doing almost exactly what we want to do, but we're so far away from it. And I was always teaching sex ed. I was always hosting sexual health groups and discussion groups and facilitating those kinds of spaces where people could have open and honest conversations about what was challenging them sexually. And that was giving me life. That was always what I kept coming back to and saying, I just want to do more of this. I just want to do more of this. And finally, I fell in love. Nothing hits your intuition quite like romantic infatuation. And my then partner, now husband, lived in Chicago, owned his own business and said to me something on the lines of, you'll never be happy if you don't work for yourself. So despite everyone in my life saying, are you sure you don't want to finish your doctorate and go down this path? I left it. It was the best decision that I ever made. I followed that like little voice inside of me that said, there's another way we can do this. And within a year of leaving that, I started my coaching business. And we're now three, almost four years 
later. I have a successful and wonderful business. I love what I do because I get to help people have I have something that that has evaded them for so long. You know, our goal here at Spark Joy, and really the whole point of doing KonMari is so that you don't have to do KonMari ever again. <laughs> and so we talk a lot about, you know, living your best life after you have done your tidying. Finishing KonMari can really help you give you an opportunity to shift your attention to things that really matter, you know, friendships and relationships and your health and, and doing all those things that we know that we should do. But sometimes the chaos in our lives before we became organized really keeps us from being able to follow that. It really helps to be able to think about how to make decisions, how to make intentional and intuitive decisions about, you know, the things that we really want, you know, tapping into that logical thinking and, and, you know, really beginning to to follow your intuition much in the same way that you did to get to where you are. Mm -hmm. How do you feel people can best tap into their intuition and become better decision makers? I think at its core, intuition lives in the body. So for me, it always comes as a felt sense. And it might be a feeling that I have like literally within my body, maybe something I can point to like the pit of my stomach or something in my throat or my heart, like something weighing heavy on my back or my shoulders. Intuition works at every single level of our life. It works on the major decisions like where I should live, what kind of house I want to have, you know, surround myself with. Do I want to be in an apartment in a city? Do I want to be in a farmhouse out in the country? Like those bigger decisions. But intuition also happens on a really small level. Like what should I eat? You know, am I being guided more towards greens? Am I being guided more towards something that's hearty, something warm, something cold, right? So we have to practice allowing our intuition to speak to us on every single level, which is brilliant because it means that we have all kinds of opportunities to tap into our intuition. Like You get thousands of opportunities to connect with your intuition on any given day, you know, from how do you want to structure your day to how do you want to approach a friend who you intuitively think kind of needs to, needs your help or needs your support, right? You can practice using your intuition in small ways, like when someone asks you a yes, no question or asks you your opinion. Or one of my favorite ways to connect with my intuition is by going out and having an unstructured day. So like leaving the house without a specific place in mind. When's the last time that you left without some place to go? That would be never. Yeah, almost never. <laughs> almost never. Exactly. Exactly. And yes, that's a bit of a luxury, but it's not impossible to schedule that time in, even if it's just taking a walk or a jog that you'd be taking anyways, right? How many of us have a really specific route that we know if I'm going to jog, I'm going to go leave the house, turn left, turn right at the stop sign. That's going to give me exactly one mile and then I can time it and everything is predictable and it's all exactly the same. Well, we're robbing ourselves of an opportunity to have like an intuitive experience. One of your previous episodes, you were talking about solo traveling and adventuring, And one of the things that I really picked up on from your guest was using your intuition to go out and get into adventures and just see what happens. Because if you leave your house and go, hmm, left or right, and then check in with your body and see which way you're being pulled, that is how you start to develop that really, really strong connection to your intuition. The other side of that, of course, is where have you been ignoring your intuition. And this is way harder. This is, Mm -hmm. I mean, this is really where the real work comes in because we spend a lot of time ignoring our felt senses, telling our intuition that it's wrong. And it's not just us. Like we got those messages when we were kids, you know, you cried when something hurt and someone told you not to cry. Well, your intuition was saying that this hurts. This is an opportunity for me to express my pain. Right. Or you had intuition as a kid and and someone told you like, no, we can't. That's rude. That goes against social norms. Leave them alone. It's none of our business. Right. You had the intuitive sense that somebody needed a hug. And, you know, as a little kid, you went to go up and hug them and someone pulled you back and said, no, don't talk to strangers. Right. So we've been told over and over and over again by the people outside of us who, who cared for us and were modeling behavior for us. And then, like myself, even when I was going through school, my intuition was saying, you know, maybe more grad school isn't the answer, but I kept going with it because I was successful at it from an external perspective. But intuitively, I was dying inside, right? So it took me a long time to sort of regain that connection with my intuition after 
having ignored it for so many years. I totally relate to what you're saying. I also was kind of on the wrong path in terms of my career, although I learned amazing things during that time frame, and I don't have any regrets. It ultimately wasn't the right path for me long term. When do we know what the right path is for ourselves? But it's interesting how we can use it. I love what you said, like how we can use it to make decisions, but we also need to be really in tune of how we're ignoring it or fighting it. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. And I feel like that comes up a lot for those working through that question, does it spark joy? It's a simple question, but it can be tough to execute for sure. And I know that you're also a Marie Kondo fan and you mm-hmm. could marry your own things. So I'd love to talk to you a bit more about how we can use intuition in that space and better understand what brings us joy. Yeah. So when we go to use our intuition, but we haven't been using it for a while, it can feel really rusty, right? Which is probably what some people are experiencing. Like, does this spark joy in their they're trying to listen inside, but that little voice that that represents our intuition has gotten really quiet because we kept telling it to shut up and go away for so long. So I know if I had tried to use the Komari method while I was going through that space of changing careers and not really knowing and not being able or willing to acknowledge what I was really passionate about, my connection to my intuition was really muted. You know, it was always Mm -hmm. there. Your intuition never, ever, ever, ever leaves. As long as there's breath in your lungs and your heart beats, your intuition goes on. But I think that appreciating the intuition is sort of like a friend that maybe you haven't called for a long time. That all of a sudden when you make a big ask of it, like, let's go through all my things (laughs) and figure out what sparks joy for us, that maybe your intuition might be a little shy, a little quiet, a little hesitant to to come forward and jump in and start speaking loudly because you haven't called on her for a while or him. So maybe practicing some of the tips that I previously mentioned or other ways that allow you to tap into your intuition, like closing your eyes, turning inside. Intuition can speak more loudly in stillness and in quiet. And I believe from what I recall, Marie Kondo says, you know, not to not to listen to music, for example, while you're organizing, right? Isn't that one mm-hmm. of her recommendations? Right. I think part of that is because your intuition speaks really softly. And if you have a lot of music and a lot of things going on that can overpower it, then it can be really hard to hear, really challenging to listen to. One of the things that we hear all the time as consultants is really two sides to the same coin, which is a great fear that I will... I, meaning the person doing KonMari, will let go of something that I will regret. And then the other side of that is, I'm just getting rid of everything. So both of those really are a way of not trusting intuition Mm -hmm. in a way. So there's that aspect. And I'm really interested to hear how and if that came into play when you were doing your own kanmari And then kind of the broader picture, which to me I think is so important when considering which direction to go in life. So for a long time, and maybe I still have this belief that it's better, at least it was better for me, and even that I made mistakes, to not make any life-altering decisions until I was 30. And for me, there was something really important about not getting into anything I couldn't easily get out of. And actually, I kept that rule until I was 40. (laughs) (laughs) And still... People make mistakes, right? I mean, Mm -hmm. somebody can be like, I know this is exactly, this is a relationship for me. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care. I know this job or whatever it might be. This is the thing for me and I'm hanging in no matter what. And someone could rightly believe that it's their intuition driving that, that they feel really strongly that it's going to work out, that it's really where they need to be. But then later they'll say something like, I always kind of knew. How do we learn how to distinguish that kind of self-will or stubborn determination that's not really good for us in the end from something like your intuition, which based on what you're saying, intuition always has our best interest in mind. I definitely felt that fear of regret. I grew up with two people who hoarded and collected and have all kinds of things. And even now my mom is like constantly sending me stuff from her home 
because they think she has so much trouble thinking that it's leaving the family that she would rather mail it to me and like let me donate it or get rid of it than actually do that herself. So I know that part of it for me was biological, but then part of it for me was just you use the keyword, which is trust. Like I had still have trouble just trusting that I have everything that I need and that anything that I need will be provided for me, given to me, like made available to me by something bigger than me, right? I'm not saying mm -hmm. like it's going to be provided to me by my husband. I mean, like the universe, spirit, God, whatever, the thing that connects all of us truly is looking out for me. And so I can give away or get rid of some of these material possessions and still have everything that I need provided for me at the time that I need it. That is a really, 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 really challenging level to get to. That is like a trust fall with the universe. But the thing is, we're in that trust fall, whether we choose to acknowledge it or not. There's a fabulous Buddhist quote that is something like, the bad news is you're falling through space and there's nothing to grab onto. The good news is there's no floor. <laughs> wow. Right? That's crazy. If that is not a apt metaphor for trusting that you can release things and know that they will come back to you if they are meant to come back to you. I really believe that part of the Kamari method, from my interpretation of it, I don't think this is actually a stretch, is that your things the material items that you have sort of have their own energy. They have their own life. They have a vibration that they are bringing to you, right? And they must vibrate along the same level as you or you would be repelled by them. So if you believe, as I do, that you attract things at your vibration, then you're not really attracting these material goods. They can come and go because it's just they just symbolize the energy, the spirit, the vibration of what you are wanting, what you are attracting, and what you are putting out into the world. I also think that we have a tendency to want to go to that other extreme of like get rid of everything because it's challenging to confront all of that energy that's been bound up in these objects, right? It's challenging to face those memories and to kind of place us in this time frame of like past, present, and future, and who am I, and, and what did this mean for how I identified at the time that I accumulated this object. And I think that that is a process of self-reflection that can challenge people because, in my opinion, this is what I would say to one of my clients, we're not coming at it with lightness and levity. You know, so much of what I personally draws me to the Kamari method is the joy aspect, right? When I start to get bogged down in the process and I, I focus too much on the individual items or the possessions that I have in my life, I lose track of the joy. I lose track of the fact that these things are supposed to be a source of joy and that they're not reflective of who I am or what makes me me. And they're certainly not reflective of my survival. I can trust that I'm going to survive either way and that these things that I've accumulated are not the key to my survival. In fact, I am the key to my survival. Fear is going to exist. Trust is the opposite of fear. Connecting with things that allow you to feel safe, safe inside of your body, safe inside of your home, safe inside of your relationships, safe and secure and rooted and grounded and connected to the earth. Like all of those things for me make me feel safe enough to cast and to release my physical possessions out into the world. One of the other questions that you asked, which was brilliant, about directions to go in life. And I love the methodology of not making life-altering decisions until being 30 or 40, although I think that we make life-altering decisions every single day. Sure. I've made a lot of decisions over the course of my life that left me with a sort of like escape hatch. Yep. Even especially in romantic relationships, which is, which of course, is funny considering what I do now. And I just recently got married, too. So I kind of like decided not to keep an escape hatch yeah. with me in this relationship. Although, you, again, you're like you're never really stuck with something and you're never really fully able to leave something. You know, one of my other favorite quotes is wherever you go, there you are. Right. Mm -hmm. So no matter what physical items we accumulate, no matter what relationships we identify with, no matter which identities we try on and play with over the course of time, like we are still us. 
we will still have the same strength, the same weaknesses, you know, the same awareness. Anything that we're not consciously working on, we are keeping with us regardless. The more that we ignore our intuition, the harder life becomes. So if anything in your life is feeling like a ton of effort, like an outrageous amount of effort, like it is taking so much of your energy, so much effort, so much will, like you feel overexerted and exhausted by any part of your life, you are probably not listening to your intuition and instead are playing out a role, like a role of what mother or lover or husband or parent or daughter or whatever, coworker, colleague, friend, you're playing a role of what you think that identity should be or should be doing instead of coming at it from the level of your soul and the level of really what is meeting the highest good of everyone involved. One of the hardest lessons for me to learn and learn and learn and learn and learn has been that the thing that is best for me is usually best for everyone else. But when I cut off that option, when I think, oh, no, I have to do this because this is truly what's best for my husband, even though it sucks for me, we both end up suffering. You know, when Mm. I go to him and I say, hey, here is what is best for me. Here is really what I need. And I can do that very clearly and consciously and with a frame of love. Not like I'm going to get my needs met and you're not. There's a win-lose scenario. Like when I try to get creative, speak my needs clearly, like communicate. And when my effort is placed into getting to a win-win scenario, I can usually find one. The truth is the intuition will speak to you in a lot of different ways. Like it will make you physically ill if you are not doing the thing that you are being called upon to do. You'll find yourself getting sick, you know. I find people who just hate their jobs end up getting more head colds than the rest of us. Ever since I started working in a job that I love, I've had like one cold. Wow. Same here. I didn't realize that was the thing until yeah, you said that. Because your body, you know, your intuition works really closely with your your, I like to call it the lizard brain, like your most basic hardware. And that that stuff can't speak to you in language, right? It doesn't it yeah. lives and think about like a lizard, right? They don't have language. They don't have imaginations. Like if you ever look at their like beady little eyes, they don't have a sense of shame. You know, like lizards are pretty basic. <laughs> but think about what lizards do have. Like, they have an immune system. They have a digestive tract. They have a sleep schedule, right? So say you are, you know, you keep oversleeping your alarm clock and getting penalized at work for showing up late like that is a way of your intuition making it so you lose your job because it recognizes on that symbolic level that making you late to work is going to end work for you Mm -hmm. so that you can go do stuff that you intuitively want to be doing so Mm -hmm. i think yeah stubborn determination will always end in physical injury or like emotional trauma or some kind of like illness that is manifest either in the physical body or the spiritual body or the emotional body that lets us know that, oh God, something has been wrong for a while now, but our bodies only just recently started to like shout about it in that way. I think that that's super interesting because I think for a lot of people, an ending is sometimes a relief, even if it's not an ending that they chose. Mm -hmm. So you hear a lot about people who get fired or leave their job for some reason and It's like, oh, it's just a relief to be leaving or a relationship is over and it's a relief to be out of the relationship, even though it may not have been something that they chose. And I really just kind of circle back to something that you said about all of the things and people that come into our lives really do stay with us. And as you were speaking, I just thought how true that is, because there will be times when I'll see a T-shirt or a shirt that looked like one that I owned a long time ago. And I'll be like, oh, I used to have one just like that. (laughs) It's amazing how... Everything that comes into our lives really, you know, there's this old cliche that says that we are the sum total of every single thing that's happened to us in the past, which is true, right? I mean, small or large, we are really just a product of everything that has occurred to us. So no matter how small or big those people, places, and things may be, they really do have a a lasting impact on us, even if we don't realize it. And I would add to that that we are the sum total of the stories we tell about what has happened to us. Interesting. Sure. Because it's none of it is objective. Mm. It's entirely subjective. And I recently was introduced to this idea, which I love, that when you change your trajectory in the present, you also change your past because you change the way that you've seen it. So like if suddenly I decide, you know, like I'm actually a survivor of all of the challenges that I've ever encountered, the lens 
through which I view my entire past shifts. Thus, the past literally changes for me. Hmm. Love that. It reminds me of people who change their story about organization as they're tidying. I've always been untidy. I've never been able to keep my house this way. I hear that a lot when I first Mm -hmm. interact with my clients. But then once they really get involved with taking a closer inventory of what's around them and practice intuitively as well as physically, really putting things away or just making really thoughtful decisions about what they have around them, they start to shift into, wow, I can really do this. I've moved on beyond this. I'm now living a different life. It's amazing. The question, does it spark joy, is a simple one, but not so easy to execute alone. Extend your tidying experience by joining the Spark Joy Club, our online community filled with our clients, fellow listeners, and Kamari enthusiasts ready to support your journey. If you find yourself buried under clothing, stuck on storage, or pointing fingers at untidy housemates or family members, we want to help you finish your tidying journey once and for all. Support the show at the Joy Riser level and receive access to our exclusive virtual community, as well as the Tidy Home Joy Journal, your number one tidying companion. Visit sparkjoypodcast.com and click on Join the Club to get started. And now back to the show. Well, speaking of tidying, you've prepared a guided visualization for us. And this is a first on Spark Joy. We would really like you to help anyone out there who is struggling to tap into their intuition, really visualize their ideal best life. This is a special gift for our listeners. And we're so grateful, Caitlin. So we'll hand it over to you and we'll participate as well. Silently, of course. (laughs) Yeah. Excellent. So go ahead and get comfortable in your seat. If you are driving, I highly recommend that you hit pause and come back and revisit this when you can keep your eyes closed and really have as much stillness around you as possible. It's going to, again, give you the best opportunity to tap into your internal world, which is where we are headed with this visualization. So go ahead and take a couple deep breaths in through your nose and out through your mouth. And as you are exhaling, you might even give a little sigh just as a way of sort of clearing the clutter from your day, clearing out the energy of whatever you've been doing, what's been on your mind or on your heart today. (sighs) And you can do that as many times as feels good to you. As we're going through this visualization, if you start to wander away mentally, that's no problem at all. Just gently and lovingly guide your focus back to my voice. And remember, you will get out of this exactly what you need to. You can trust that it's not every word in its specificity that is important, and rather the time, the energy, and the intention that you are bringing. I want you to start by focusing your attention on the space just above your head, really as if you could reach out into the space around you for divine inspiration. The best ideas, the most creative thoughts, the things that truly inspire us seem to pop into our minds. They're not of our minds. We are the recipients of thoughts, the recipients of guidance and of intuition. And by connecting to the space around you, you are opening the channel, opening the portal, so to speak, to allow guidance, inspiration, powerful ideas and thoughts to come to you. Take a deep breath. Exhale with a sigh. And now bring your attention to the center of your forehead. And I want you just to 
relax and breathe into this space as much as possible and start to get a visual of what it is you'd like to create. See if you can add light and color, if you can actually see it with your mind's eye with as much detail as possible. So if it feels a little foggy at first, see if you can see yourself getting a little bit closer. See if perhaps you can turn up the brightness, the detail, the contrast, the resolution. See if you can step closer to the thing that you are visualizing. And perhaps if this is the first time that you are doing this, it's a little foggy. Remember, you can always come back as you create, as you get closer and closer to the thing that you are visualizing and tune back into your intuition for more details. Take a deep breath and exhale. Now, as you've got the visual in mind and you're holding your focus and giving that your attention and your energy, I want you to imagine bringing that down into your throat. Take a deep breath and just feel the air sort of expand in your throat, your upper chest, even in your mouth and your jaw. This is where we add communication truth, honesty, when we add words to what it is that we are looking to create, everything that we can dream up, that we can make, that we can see, we can share with other people through the power of our words, our voice, our language, whether that be spoken word or written word. Imagine how you describe the language that you use to communicate your vision. What kinds of words, descriptors, adjectives, nouns, what words come up to the surface for you? And if none are blaringly loud, just see if you can, in the stillness, connect with one or two words that really, really spark joy, cause inspiration, and feel right, intuitively right, because they've come from your inside sense and through the process of allowing. Take a deep breath. Now, I want you to tune into your heart, the center of your chest. As you breathe, feel your chest rise and fall. Feel into the space around your heart. This is where we add love. This is where we add transformation. Everything that we do and everything that we are has been transformed through love. There's no more powerful source of transformation than the human heart and the human ability to love. When you add love to anything, whether that is yourself, a child, an animal, even someone who's passed away when you lovingly think back onto them, when you add love to your home, when you add love to the items in your home, when you shine your love on anything or anyone, you transform it. So if you're struggling to find that deep transformative love for you, I ask that you think about someone or something that you love that's innocent, like a puppy, a baby, And remember that the depth of the love that you feel for anything is the depth of love that you yourself are capable of creating and experiencing. So if you love your child or you love an animal with all your heart, that's your heart that's doing the loving. That's your endless well of love. And I challenge you to turn that around and Give that to yourself from time to time, especially as you confront major challenges or things that can be very tricky, like reorganizing or creating a space that feels like home. If you do that with love, you will transform your surroundings in the best, brightest, most powerful, most energized way. The heart is also where our physical body and our energy body come together, sort of the portal between them. It connects our 
higher senses with our physical space around us. It connects the energy to the actual material world. So this is an especially important space to work in, to visualize, to breathe into through this process that really marries energy and material. Take a deep breath. Exhale. And bring your attention down into your solar plexus. This is the source of your fire. You are going to need to burn brightly in order to actually physically change the space around you. This is where your power and your will live and not the will to transform something through brute strength, but the will to do something that calls upon your inner energy, your battery, your zest. Take a big deep breath into this space and feel your power generating. Feel all of the energy that you will need to perform this task coming to you easily and effortlessly. <sighs> Trust that you have all of the physical energy that you need to get everything that you want to and that you are being guided to accomplish done. Take a big deep breath in, <sighs> exhale with a sigh and call all of your attention down to your sacrum. This is where your womb exists. If you have a womb, this is where your lower abs and your lower back, just above the last vertebra of your spine in the center of your body. And whether you identify or have a womb or had a womb at any point, this is where your creation and your creativity lies. This is also where your fun is. This is where we add fun and joy and laughter and pleasure to all of the activities, no matter what it is that we are doing. Bringing this space forward, calling upon this space to add fun and lightness and joyousness and creativity to this process. Take a deep breath and exhale. <sighs> now call all of your attention to your root. This is where your body literally connects to the floor, to the chair or the couch, or the bed, whatever you are sitting on, whatever you are supported by, your body literally rests and reconnects to the earth. And in this space, I ask you to imagine the actual physical material reality that you have created. See it as if it were already there, as if you could literally reach out and touch it, that it is as real as anything that already exists in the physical plane. Remember, everything in the physical plane was first imagined using this same process that we just guided you through. <sighs> Rest and trust in knowing that whatever you set your mind to, whatever you energize through your communication, through your heart, through your power, through your energy, through your fun, through your joy, can come to exist in this space. You have everything that you need to create whatever your mind can conceive. Take a deep breath and I want you to feel Feel the energy, feel your awareness and your intention slide up and down throughout your entire body, just organizing and energizing every cell in your body and bringing them into alignment so that you may create what you have determined to make. <sighs> Excellent. What do you think, ladies? That really was amazing. So good, Caitlin. I loved it. Thank you. I love doing that. That was really insightful, and it really did help me really uh, hone in on something that I was I'm hoping to accomplish over the next couple of months. So mm -hmm. that was super great. And now it seems like a really great time to ask you, what is sparking the most joy for you in your life? Going back to something we touched on at multiple points is. I've been working out with a physical trainer for the past several months and my ability to connect in and trust in my body has never been better. Just living in this body, I struggled with 
asthma and other chronic conditions that really prevented me from trusting in my body's ability. And the more that I work with my body in loving and gentle and intentional ways, and take really good care of it, the more joy that I find movement and everything. I mean, what doesn't your body, your body allows you to experience the entire world. So being in my body, trusting in my body, being grateful to my body, treating it really well. I go to see a, um, a network spinal chiropractor too. That makes me feel really aligned in my spine and really good and juicy in my body. So that is definitely in this moment what is sparking the most joy in my life. And we know from what you've said earlier that you have kanmai your own home mm -hmm. and you're familiar with the method for sure. So could you tell us what your favorite tidying tip is? For me, the, my favorite tidying tip is to tidy in cycles or seasons. I tidy along with my personal cycle. I know that when I am in my follicular phase of my cycle leading up to ovulation, I have the most physical energy. So that is when I do the major tasks that are necessary, like especially seasonal cleaning. I try to reorganize and clean out our storage spaces at least once a year, usually in the spring, sometimes twice a year. So I try to time everything along with the seasons. And I also try to tie them along with my personal phase, like where I am at in my own cycle. And then for the luteal phase, like leading over to menstruation, the second half of my cycle, I know I'm going to be better at the details. So that is when I focus on organizing like files in my computer or books in my library or smaller things like notes, projects, planning, things along those lines. And for those people listening who don't have a cycle, used to have a cycle, who've never had a cycle, you can time yours along with the phases of the moon. So considering the waxing moon as the moon grows to be the time to do those larger, more physically demanding tasks. And then the waning moon after it's been full and is going back to the new moon as the time to do those more uh, detail oriented, smaller requiring less physical energy, more mental energy tasks. And the reason this has been really, really helpful for me is that I had to stop beating myself up for sometimes not being in the mood to do something. And it gives me permission to to recognize that like, yes, I might not be exactly in the perfect headspace to do this right now. But if I have a vision and a plan for when that time might come around, I can give myself permission to do that thing then. And that's been incredibly helpful for me in being more gentle and more loving and more forgiving of myself and also just creating more intention and a bigger picture around tidying and organizing and cleaning my space. Wow, I love that just being in tune with your body and not trying to fight the urge to maybe, I don't know, ignore tidying mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. just knowing when that, that it makes more sense to actually execute the activity based on just how you're feeling in your space, in your body, in your soul, and in your intuition. It's amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom today, Caitlin. Do you have any additional parting thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? You've already given us so much insight. I just want to say that the work that you're doing is amazing and it is challenging and it can be such a massive source of joy. So if anyone out there is like, oh, that visual visualization is challenging for me or I've been ignoring my intuition for a long time, I'm afraid it's not there, like my wish for you is just that you be really gentle with yourself and treat yourself like you would treat your very best friend as you are going through this process. So a combination of like gentle encouragement and sometimes like real tough love, but only when it is necessary and only when it actually helps you. Thank you so much for coming on our show, Caitlin, and Thank sharing you. that beautiful visualization. I selfishly can't wait to edit this show because <laughs> I can't wait to listen to it again and use it to tap into my own intuition and reach my goals. So thank you for joining us and sharing your gifts. Thank you for having me. To connect with Caitlin, you can check out her podcast, The Oral Report, which airs every Friday. And her awesome YouTube channel that's viewed by millions, youtube.com 
forward slash Caitlin V, and that's spelled C A I T L I N V as in Victor. Just for SparkJoy listeners, Caitlin is offering a free 30 minute consultation call. You can sign up by heading to bettersexcoach.com and click on contact to set up your call and be sure to mention where you heard about her. So now we want to hear from you. Tell us your burning, kiting questions or share stories about how Kamari has impacted your life. Head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe and review the show, which helps us reach others along their tidying journeys. To extend your tidying experience, you can join the Spark Joy Club. Visit sparkjoypodcast.com and click join the club to become a member of the Spark Joy community, or you can join us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope your day sparks joy. Thank you for listening to Spark Joy with your host, Kristen Ivy of For the Love of Tidy in Chicago and Karen Sochi of The Serene Home in New York City. Spark Joy, the podcast, is not endorsed by or affiliated with Kamari Media Inc. The opinions expressed on this episode represent the views of the co hosts and guests alone and do not represent the corporate position of Kamari Media Inc. or the Kamari Consultant Community.